You ready for the word? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the honor, the privilege of being able to minister your word. Father, we commit this service into your hand, and we, I yield myself to you. I pray you will use me tonight to bring clarity and revelation, hope and healing and restoration to every person here tonight. I pray your word will pierce every darkness, every hardened heart, every person that's fallen asleep spiritually will be awakened tonight. We give you the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. amen. I want you to turn me to the book of Proverbs. Um, I want to talk to you about leaving an inheritance. How, has anyone ever left you money? Has anyone ever left you money? How many left you... Parents, parents left you money or someone left you money. I've never been inherited a dime. My father died. The only thing he left me was his name, good man. That is it. Not a penny. You think when your dad dies, you're going to make it rich. But I want to talk to you about a different kind of inheritance tonight. Um, Proverbs 13 verse 22 says that a good man, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So when we talk about children's children, we're talking generationally. I look around today and I see a lot of people who can only see today. Christians who, um, they, they, this is their mindset. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have two or three children. I'm going to get a house, get a nice car. And as far as they're concerned, that is it. But what we don't seem to understand is our life not only affects us, but affects generations to come. There's a, I was speaking to someone today and he said to me, in our church, everyone's divorcing. Is, I don't know what's going on. Everyone I know is getting divorced in church. So how, how many know when a couple divorces, it is not just separating from each other. It's much far reaching than just two people going their own way. I, we did a, a course a few years ago on people who come from a divorce home and the shock of all shocks are women and men in their 50s who'd never remarried because they're still suffering from the, the, the breakdown of their home. And I, was, I've, I believe in training. You believe in training? I was in a lift the other day with my family and um, my son, Dominic, I'd always, from the time he was a boy, I'd teach him things like be a gentleman. You all know how to be a gentleman? You know what a gentleman is? Is that you? Do you qualify? So when you're on the train and the lady's sitting there, you get up and give you a seat? You don't look down on your phone? <laughs> Is that what you do? Okay, so I, I'm coming out of the lift and I, I've got my phone, I'm sending a text and I forgot that there was a lady in front of me and I felt someone hook me in my neck with a finger and pull me back. That was my son. How did he know that? He said, you should know better than that. How would he know that? Because from the time he's a boy, every time he walked out of the lift, I'll hook him in his neck with his, my finger and put him back and say, ladies first. And some of the things we, we do today, we don't seem too conscious of the next generation. So I want to go through some scriptures with you today and try and help you to understand that what we have to leave is much more than money. Most of us have not had money, but some of the things I saw, some of the images I saw from my mother and father, I've never seen them argue. But also, I've never seen them kiss. I've never seen them cuddle. How we got here was a mystery until I got older. Because I've never seen any affection, no affection from my parents towards each other. They would eat, they would have dinner. My father had his own chair. My mother would bring his food for him, and she would, he would put the plate down, and she would pick it up. And he would have his own cup, brown, his white, brown, and black with circles around it. He would drink it, put his cup down. My mother would come and pick it up. And he, he, he would call us. The old days, there was a TV where the aerial, he would make you hold the aerial until it, the, it stabilized while he watched cricket. And as soon as it, you drop it as quick as you can and run for your life. But when I got married, I tried it. I thought that was the role model. So my wife comes from a background where her role model is her father made a breakfast in bed. So you can imagine the clash when we married. I'm waiting for her to bring the food, and she's waiting for me for bring breakfast in bed. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a conflict of interest there. So if we didn't change, something's going to happen. So we made the decision that when we, I, I made the decision, when I got married, it was not going to be like that. And I want to help you tonight, because when we talk about leaving an inheritance, there is... There is something we can leave within our children. These men and these women that came up, memorizing scripture, we don't get paid for it. 
there is something we're trying to leave in them. Because how many know, I've been to a church, the church I was in before we took it over, the pastor has never fasted or called a fast one single day. Not one day. But then I was in the church with Bishop Malachi Ramsey, a Pentecostal preacher from Shiloh United Church of Christ, Child of the Church of Christ, Apostolic Inc. That was Bishop Ramsey's church. But that man put us to fasting. Prayer meeting was mandatory. We would fast and we would pray. This week we had Bishop Miller's uh, wife in, in America who uh, was, was diagnosed with something cancerous, a lemon-sized, not a melon, a lemon-sized lump in her stomach. My father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer. My wife, a couple of years ago, was in hospital in Athens where it was touch and go. But the first thing we do, we start fasting, we start praying. Where did I get the fasting from? Every January here, we fast the month of January. We summoned me and the guys, we fasted from January till March every day. But, but that came from someone that imprinted me. He imprinted me with the power of prayer, the power of fasting. If it had been to the first pastor, there's, we probably wouldn't be alive because there's so many things that go, go on in your life. And remember, Jesus said, there are certain types of spirit that will not go except through fasting and prayer. And if you don't know how to pray, you've, you've, you've lost one of your major weapons. And how many know, Jesus' disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. So you don't teach yourself. You come to church. How many know church is the breeding ground for growth? Some people say, well, you know, I, I love God. I don't have to come to church. Well, that's not what Jesus said. He said, you should not forsake the assembling of yourself as a man of some is. If you need someone to chase you every week to come to church, spiritually, you're less than a baby. Because we should get to the place where church attendance is normal. How many, for, anyone force you to eat? Anyone force you to use the bathroom? How many know if you can eat physically, you can eat spiritually? And church is the only place you're going to grow. He said he sent the church, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, to perfect the saints so they could do the work of the ministry. So if you're one of those that keep, stay at a distance, and when you come to church, you do not come to do your own thing. You come to submit, you come to be taught, you come to be trained, and you come to be disciplined. He says, preach the word in season, out of season, rebuke, exalt with all long suffering. So we are supposed to rebuke and challenge people. So I'm not here to make you feel happy tonight. If you're feeling depressed, overcome it. How do you overcome it? With the word. You don't come in and say, well, I really thought you were going to give me a good message tonight. I'm not here to give you a good message. I'm here to challenge you. And you're supposed to grow what you hear. What was preached on Sunday morning? Wow. In that deep? In that deep? What was preached on Sunday morning? You're picking up off of someone else. What did I tell you to do? What did I tell you to do? Every time you hear a message, you get the download, you listen to it all week, over and over, because it goes from your head into your heart. One woman, one tape from one woman, Dr. Wanda Turner, years ago, we took that tape and listened over and over and over until we understood how to train and discipline our children according to the scriptures. So you can you could be one of those hearers that come in, hear it, sit there. But listen, unless you're going to apply what you hear, it's not going to profit you. Are, are you. are you listening to me? And that means for you to understand it, you have to get it into you so you can pass it on to someone else. Now, in the book of uh, Judges, chapter 2, listen to this. Judges, chapter 2. There is a generation right now. How many of the church right now is in trouble? I'm not talking about, it doesn't mean the devil's won. He will never win. Because God says, where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. But what I'm saying to you today, over the last 10 years, the face of the church is transformed. What we knew as church, like, you know, like the NIV Bible, those of you who use electronic Bibles, and you have the, the NIV on your phone, you won't know that the NIV has removed over 66,000 words from the Bible. So when it upgrades, it upgrades without you knowing the changes. And because some of you have never been around before this move that we have in, where men marry women, men, marry men, women marry women preachers are now tenders, no hell, 
preachers are telling you grace, grace is grace is sufficient. You can live any way you want. How many know if you live any way you want and you know there's no consequences, you live totally differently to what you do when you know the consequences? So now this, this message is I'm really, I, I can't adapt to what the world is saying. I can't adapt to you can't use the name of Jesus. You, I can't adapt to you can't preach, you can't say certain things. How many would be reason, re, willing to give your life for this word? But look at this, in, in Judges chapter 2, he says this from verse 10. And also that generation were gathered unto their fathers. Every generation becomes weaker and weaker unless there's a great passion in, that, in those people. Like you'll see this generation, what you see as church now, the next wave is coming. It's going to be like crazy compared to what we are now. Where the church is now in, in 10 years will look really strong compared to what's yet to come. I saw it years ago when preachers began to wear true religion jeans. Now, someone bought me a pair of true religion jeans. It looked great, but inside was a big statue of a Buddha. I'm sure I'm not the only one that saw the statue of Buddha, but preachers choose to wear jeans. And they say to me, how should we dress when we come? I always say to them, how would you dress if the queen invited you? Now, if the, king, if the king of glory come into his presence, it's not a clothesline preacher, but it's a matter of respect. You don't wear hat men when you come into church. You don't wear hat in a building, whether it be church or not. You take your hat off, right? He says this, and, and also, all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, Judges chapter 2, verse 10, there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. And, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of the enemies round about, so that they could not any longer stand before the enemies. We are at a place right now, if we do not become passionate about God, the next generation will, be, will forget who God is. What do you talk about most? Families, I watch it now, I'm shocked of shocks where babies have phones playing with. You watch, pick up someone's child with a phone in your hand and their little fingers going like this, wants to scroll on your phone. We are, we are changing the course of destiny when we become cold toward God. Are you passionate about God? Yes. Really? Are you, would you say you're passionate about God? Yes. Okay, today we've had, what's the time now? 9.30, we've had how many hours today? In two and a half hours, the day will be up. So we had, what, 22 and a half hours today? How much have you given him of your 22 and a half hours? How much have you invested in your heart today? How much have you given to him? How much, did you, how much time did you spend with him today? When you wake up in the morning, what is the first thing on your mind? Is it your phone? What is it? Check your messages? Are you here? I'm talking about if this generation loses the passion for God, the next generation does not stand a chance. And what makes it worse is it's not just normal Christianity we're dealing with now. We're dealing with a compromised Christianity. A Christianity where the measure of success is the number in your church. But it's not how many people come through your door. It's how many people enter, enter heaven based on what you said or what we failed to say. It is the, the parents that have the time to train their children. The Bible says train your child in the way they should go. Whether you train them about God or not, you're training them. When you let your child, I watch today, my father, I don't know about your dad, but my dad had the look. You ever get the look from your parent? Actually, he was just going to run up here when Mary Lou struggled a little bit. He was going to run up there and give him the look. He, he dropped back down because you know what precedes the look. If you mess up on the, if the look don't work, then you get something else. But I watch parents now, you're trying to train your children according to your knowledge. 
And the worst thing is you've never been a parent. And I, people say, well, you know, you know, that discipline stuff is in the Old Testament. He says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. That was in Solomon's day. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You drive it from them with a the naughty corner. Johnny, sit down. Don't make mommy mad. Mommy not going to talk again, Johnny. Johnny, the last warning. hundred times later, Johnny... Johnny knows you're like the dog chained. You, you bark, but you got no bite. I can resolve your child issue in two, two movements. <laughs> when, when my little grandson, we, we went to a, a, a restaurant for my birthday in Trafalgar Square. A nice restaurant. And he was being a brat. I took him to the bathroom. You ever had, your parents ever took you for bathroom breaks? I took him by his neck, by his collar here. I slid him up the wall. I didn't hit him. I, I slid him up the wall so he's eye level with me. I said, how dare you? How dare you mess up my party? How dare you mess up my, my, my dinner? If you ever make another sound, I'll come in and I'll beat you to a pulp. Do you understand me? He said, granddad, you're frightening me. That's called consequences. Has he ever done it again? If foolishness was bound in the heart of a child back then, what's bound in them now? Are you with me? So we need to make a decision to train the next generation. Whoever you are, someone's watching you. I don't care who you are. Somebody somewhere is watching you. You may be the least of, in your mind, the least in the church or the least on earth. Somebody's watching you. We should be role models for somebody. Let me ask you a question. Who are you training? Who have you taken as a project to invest what you know into them? The, the, different, the culture now, how many know the name of your great-grandmother? How, how many know the name of your great-great-grandfather? In the black culture, we don't pass knowledge on. And even in workplaces, people, what we do, listen, the key to success is passing on what you know to make yourself redundant. So the next person is empowered. I want to train other people to do what I do. Moses and Alicia did a great job the other day. Do you not agree? They grew up in church. When that time I, say, I said to them, I really believe God wants you to speak today. And they said, no, no, no. That falls on deaf ears. They had to get up here. That whether they said anything or not is not the issue. Get up here and face the fear. And they did a great job. Who are you taking the time to invest in? Think about it. You have a child. I said this actually the other day. What's the greatest, five greatest footballers? Did it, did it, did Rolls them off like that. Name me five books of the Bible. Name me five great men of the Bible. And everyone said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Forget Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Let's go to Old Testament. <laughs> Give me five people that impacted their generation from the Bible. And what we have to do is we have to make a conscious decision to sit down with our children. The first place we should be training is in the household. You cannot leave your children to watch what they want, when they want, how they want, whenever they want. We should be monitoring what they watch. How many times do we do Bible studies with them? How many times do we give them scriptures? Learn this. And the best part of all is we model by example. By example, right? So my children must see me hug my wife. My children, your son will learn how to love a woman by dad the way you love your, his mother. The way you treat his mother will be his example of what a man should be. The way you treat, the, when Dominic was born, he was like, he was the only boy amongst three, three sisters. That's frightening. But all them little dollies about. All them little dolly dresses, I made him do boxing, I made him do martial arts, I made him do everything. I, I, I punched him up, I threw him around, we rough up each other, but the problem is, he's bigger than me now, so we stopped. That, that's, ungodly, that's an ungodly activity to play now. But he is, I was made sure he was a man's man. But I also would make him treat his sisters like ladies. One time he brought a girl to the house, I heard the girl screaming, and I look, he's got the girl by a foot dragging around the house. One leg, he's playing. Say, Dom, that's not the way you treat a woman. 
Would you agree? Would you be happy for your, uh, your uh, uh, potential boyfriend to grab you by your foot and drag you mopping the floor with you? Would you be happy with that? That's not the right attitude, right? So now he's grown. He's got that now. If Dominic takes you out, ladies, he will, he will treat you like a queen. He will never let you, he'll never run in the car in the rain, open his door, close the door, start the door, start the car, and then eventually put the heater on, put the wipers on, and open the door for you. He will never do that. He'll treat you properly, right? So what we do, it begins with training. Psalm 78, look at that with me. One of the things we've learned, my wife and I, her mother and father are in the 80s. They've never divorced. They've only been married one time. My mother and father were married until my father passed away. My father, my mother, when my father died, lots of these little old men will come around, perverts, <laughs> trying to chat up my mother. She drove them off. She was a one woman, one man woman, if that's the right word. She would not allow anyone to come near her. In Psalm 78, now we saw, I saw those things, and for me, when, I got, when I'm married now, we've been married for 41 years, and divorce is never an option. Because what I saw, the, my parents could do it, and if they could do it without Christ, surely I can do it with Christ, in Christ. So after 41 years, the way I look at it is like, if I've been married for 41 years, it would be like walking on this journey for 41 years. Can you imagine that? Every day you, get, you walk this journey. For 41 years you walk. That's like walking around the world, right? And after 41 years, you now decide that's enough. And you've got to go all the way back from, the, from that to the beginning. To do what? With who? And you meet some girl now wants to have children. My God, mine has grown. Who wants to go back to, to wipe cleaning nappies and, and then... You get a young wife and you've got to retrain someone all over again. Get me breakfast. Do, don't laugh like that in public. Walk properly. Walk your legs straight. The, you know, all the different things. You grow together. You, who wants to go back and do that? Who wants to go and start life all over again? 41 years. Who would want to do that? Isn't it better to stay where you are? Fight the battles and overcome it and, and move on again, right? So what he says here. Give ear, Psalm 7 8 says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I'll open my mouth in a parable. I'll utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. Do we hide anything from our children? You may not hide it willfully, but when you withhold information about God, your children need to be sat down with you on a regular basis and talk about God. When I take Ashley to school when his mom's not around, the first thing we do is we have a conversation. I say, Ashley, who do you not like in your school? And immediately he bursts out the name he doesn't like. And I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. The Bible tells us what to do. We're going to pray for him. So he, we, at first his prayer is very shallow, very weak. And we, we do it, we do it, and we pray. And he comes back after two days. He said, Granted, it really works. He, he's, he's actually become my friend now. Can we pray for so-and-so? And we talk about attitude. We talk about unforgiveness. We talk about things that will impact him in his lifetime. We tell him what the Bible said. We talk about the things of God. Do you do that? The time you take your baby, rocking your baby to, to sleep every day, speak the word over them. They memorize things. So tell them about God. Take your children, sit them down, and share about Christ. Listen to me, and I'll say this to every man here today, or women. What happens to you if your partner or your mother or your father or church, what happens if you die today? What would happen to everyone around you? I tell you what happened to my family or to everyone around me. I've empowered everybody I know. I've taught everybody everything I know. When my daughter was 18, I had a Ferrari. I made her drive the Ferrari. I have a, a Range Rover. I made her drive the Range Rover. I make them all drive everything I have. I make them, when Ashley's a baby, we make him order from the menu. We empower them. Whatever. You, you do things. You, you, you face challenges. And we show them what to do so that they can learn to do it. Some, a lot of people don't want other people to be empowered because it makes us insecure. 
but I want my family to know what to do. If I die today, nothing will change in this church. The only thing that will change is I won't be here. But everything else will function as normal. Is that what happened in your house? Some of you men are afraid to empower your wife. Listen to me, your wife is your greatest asset. Don't be afraid to push her and cause her to succeed. A lot of men, when they see their wife rising up, they become insecure, insecure. I want my wife, I want my children to be strong people. I want them to know God for themselves. I want them to succeed in life. And, you know, I taught everyone. I taught my daughters. I taught my son. I taught my wife. I taught my son. I told them all to drive. But now they'll all tell you they drive better than me. Everyone's entitled to a fantasy once in a while. But they're all convinced that they didn't want to drive. I mean, you know, when you drive, it empowers you. You don't get the weirdo, psst, one beer, psst, 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 psst. You lock your door, you put your handbag on the floor, and you, you, you put your heater on, and you have your phone charged, and you have it open 999. <laughs> I've taught them when you drive, if it, look in your mirror, if there's anyone behind you, and you do a left turn, and they're behind you, and you do a right turn, they're behind you, 999. When Sarah and Daniel were coming down, when they passed their test, we got them a little beetle bug, and we drove behind them and taught them how to drive on a motorway. They used to swing, when they come up, They'd swing straight out in the next lane. Fast cars coming. Phone open. Teach them how to drive. Teach them how to, if they were coming down the motorway and there's a weirdo, they didn't, they didn't engage the weirdo. They dial 999. Where are you? Next junction, junction 12. By the time they get there, woo, woo, woo. Take the weirdo out and they keep on moving. <laughs> you empower them. You train them. Are you with me? You train them with the things of God. It's important that they know God for themselves. What legacy will you leave when you're gone? There's a guy who was in this church, 60 years old, never married, never had a child. He left the earth without leaving one single footprint. Who will remember you and what will they remember you for when your day, when your day comes to leave? Your mother, but what would your children say about you? We had a guy who died one time and his own children did not want his dead body. They found a church because he had a track in his pocket without a dress on it. And they contacted his family and his family did not want his dead body. We had to give him a pauper's funeral because his family didn't want him. Why didn't they want him? Something he did in his, in his time with his family, they, they did not want him. We should be pouring into our families, pouring into people around us. Those of you who sit back and spectate, it's your choice. But you can come in, you can engage, and you can glean knowledge. You can glean understanding. You can grow spiritually. But every one of us should have someone we're training and pouring in the knowledge we have. If, you're, if you play the keyboard, you should take someone and teach them to play the keyboard. Whatever you do, teach someone and pass your skill on. Remember Matthew 25? Jesus talked about this, the gifts, five, three, five to one, five to, five, two, then one. And the one who did nothing with his, he was rebuked. But we're supposed to take the talent, the gift that God has given us. When I leave this earth, you'll hear a lot of people and you'll say, they sound like him. They speak like him. Why? Because I'm constantly trying to train somebody else. Are you? You're going very quiet. That's a good sign. It says, for he established, verse 5 says, for he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers, but they should make them known to their children. A command that he commanded them, make it known to your children. Our children is the greatest evangelist, the evangelist tools we have. I spoke to Bishop Miller this morning. He said to me, his wife, he went to the bathroom, and his wife had collapsed between the bath and the, sh the, the, the toilet and the, the shower. He couldn't pick her up. He called his son and his his um, son, his son-in-law, and his, his 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 daughter, they couldn't pick her up. Now it got close, and I said to him, "And tell me now, what's your thoughts now? I know where he's at now." And I said, "You preach all over the world, constantly." I said, "Add up, add up, how many days, weeks, and months you've been away from your wife? Now we wait until something goes wrong, and now we want to start being loving, right?" He says, I actually went to my computer, looked at all my invitations, and asked myself, 
What am I doing with all these churches? I said, how many people in your church just got up and left without even saying a word to you? It happens. Doesn't it happen all the time? You forsake your wife, your children, all that. Me, I have revelation. I, have, I was last week, I was at the lounge with my wife, date. We're at breakfast, date. We're in Switzerland, date. We're going to Lisbon, date. We're going to Jamaica, date. We have, we're going to dinner, date. We're at the Shard, date. How about you, brothers? When was the last time? And some of you, we do it with work. Work, 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 work. Isn't it funny how some of you work, 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 and you still broke at anything? <laughs> no, how many jobs you do, you never seem to make enough. You know why? Because you're not putting God first. When God comes first, he will give you the power to get wealth. When you seek first his kingdom, he'll add things to you. Isn't it funny how the Christian world, they, they work, 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 and never have any money. You say, let's go to dinner. You've got to give six months notice so they save up 25 pounds. <laughs> go to Jews. Go to Jewish community. They close on a Friday and a Saturday, what we call premium days. They close on a Friday, Saturday, and you know, when you look at the Jewish children, all the family go down Golders Green, and you see all the family walk into the synagogue on a, on a Saturday and a Friday. If you look at the Christian, it's a different story. The Jews understand the power of training the next generation. They understand the power of, of passing on knowledge and information to the next generation. They don't just pass it on, they make the kids practice it. When, we, when you see, you go down to Golders Green, the little ones have the black hat on and the curly hair and the, the black robe. They, they all, from a child, they train them. When they grow, they don't know any other way. And you know when a zebra, when a zebra is born, a foal is born, how many know every zebra looks the same? Could you identify one? Do you know if, if, if I named 10 zebras, Charlie, Mike, Alpha, Romeo, and I say, I'll give you a million pounds if you pick Charlie out for me. How many think you could pick Charlie out? So what, how does a zebra do it? When the foal is born, they shield it. The mum, watch them, the mum will shield it from all the other zebras. Why? Because until that zebra learns its mother's stripes, it will not see another zebra. By the time that foal is weaned, it knows who its mother is. Out, out of all those stripes that look the same, somehow that zebra knows the stripes of its mother. Yet we need to be weaned and shield, shielded from the things of the world. That's why when you come into church, you don't hang around the wrong people. Proverbs 13, 20 says, if you walk with wise men, you will get wise. If you keep the company of fools, you don't become a fool. He said it will destroy you. So when you come to church, you need to get away from the negative people that are always trying to pull you down. You need to get around people that are passionate about God. Let me tell you, if, the, if your friends are not passionate about God, you're not going to make it. Because iron sharpness iron, so the man of countenance of his friend. You need to get around people who are more passionate about God than you. If you get around someone who's less passionate than you, you're in serious trouble. You need to get around people who burn for Jesus. When you don't read your Bible, say, have you read your Bible today? Have you prayed today? Why are you not in church? You don't need people to say, oh, we've been to church last week. Let's miss a week. That's the wrong kind of people. They'll take you down to hell. Are you listening to me? It says, verse 6 says, that the generation to come might know them even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children. Generationally, we have to start thinking beyond today. The Christian today is caught up in a world of materialism. They want houses, they want cars. Hey, when you die, it stays here. It's not, you can't take it with you. And if you could, it would have no value where you're going. Up or down. We need to get around people who are passionate for God. And you need to get people around you that will push you. Isn't it funny how we, people, we get around people? People don't like to be pushed. Oh, you're too legalistic. Oh, all you talk about is God, God, God. What else is there? Without him, where would we be? If you don't have people around you when you're slipping away, to pull you back, you're in serious trouble. And if you get people who agree with you on everything, you're in even more trouble. When you get people when you're doing wrong and they're, not af they, they, they're afraid to challenge you, something is missing. It says, Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, 
but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. How does a friend and the enemy get close enough to kiss you? They come as a friend. How does, a, how does the, the wound of a faithful friend wound you? The same as a surgeon's scalpel. He cuts you not to kill you. He cuts you to heal you. You've got to get around people that are not afraid to speak the truth to you. That's how you're going to grow. When you're, when, you're, when you're misbehaving, they'll say, hey, what are you doing? And it's funny what we do. We shut down the positive people and open our ears to the negative people. We want people around us that's not going to challenge us. I don't want to be the same, do you? Okay, let's go on to, look, let me show you a couple of people here. Everyone should be training someone. Elijah, Elijah trained Elisha. Served him, poured water on his hand, got a double portion of his anointing. Moses had his Joshua up the mountain with him. When, when Moses' time came, Joshua took over. We have, um, we have David with his Solomon and David's mighty men. Well, look at some of David's mighty men. We have Jesus with his disciples. Isn't it funny? Jesus was not trying to build the largest church in the world. What was his, what was his goal? Take 12 minus 1 and train them to do what I do. When he left, that 11 went out and done what he did. He says, greater works than these, should, the, the, he says, the works that I do shall you do, and greater works than these shall you do. Well, question, what can we do that's greater than what Jesus did? He, did he evangelized. What miracle did Jesus do that we can do greater? Huh? The only thing we can do greater, because he did it all. He opened the blind eye, deaf ears, raised the dead. I mean, Lazarus, four days, raised the dead. He did it all. What can we do? The one miracle Jesus could not do was to become, to get people born again. How could they be born again until the sacrifice was paid for? And the works that we do now, the greatest miracle that we can ever perform in his name is when we lead someone to Christ and their spirit becomes born again. At that moment, their name's written into the Lamb's Book of Life. And a lot of us think about this, a lot of us, because we don't think generationally, we don't even witness the people. When's the last time you witnessed to somebody? Think about it. When's the last time? It shouldn't be evangelism on a Saturday. It should be a lifestyle. The Muslims right now, the Muslims right now are producing six to eight children per household. Six to eight children per household. Numerically, the average person, non-Christian and Christian, the average household is 1.8 children. Think about it. In 20 years, in 20 years, there's six to eight what would it be compared to our 1.8? Numerically alone, they will outvote us on every, every side. And on top of that, the Christian is so caught up because we don't think generationally. We're so caught up with materialism, our house, our car. How do you get blessed with the house and you stop coming to church? How do you start a business and your business takes you away from church? How can you have a business and your business now stops you praying? You're not thinking generation. You don't know who God is. It is him that gives you the power to get well. Money should never be our motive. It should be God first, and as you, as you seek him, he will add those things to you. But we call Christians, I can't be in church on Sunday because I'm trying to build my business. I can't be in church on Wednesday because I, I'm, I'm, I've got, I've got uh, jobs coming up. Listen to me. God first. God first. When you put him first, I've been at home. When we got saved, with no food, no money, and my whole thing has always been, lock yourself in the room. So, seek God, fast and pray, and while I'm in the room, my wife, as I come out, my wife shows me an envelope, and someone dropped the money through our letterbox. We don't know who it is. They didn't knock and say, hello, the Lord thy God sendeth me, claiming the glory. They just put it through the letterbox, and it's more than we needed. Folks, if we would learn to trust God some more, Instead of leaning to our own understanding, if we learn to get to the place where God really does become our source, if God can start, cause the moon to stand still and the sun to stand still, if God could open the Red Sea, if God could cause water to come from a rock, if God could feed people with quails and manna from heaven, 
It means that the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore can supply your needs, whatever your needs are. You don't have to lean on your own understanding. If you would put God, what we've done, we've, we've, we've squatted and we've pla- we reached this place, we got born again. And I don't understand how someone can be born again, experience Jesus in a real way and forget who he is. How can you get born again? I don't know where you're coming from. I swore from three years old. I would go behind the outhouse toilet and I'd practice swear words. I would tell you things about your mother that will make you vomit. I would swear, in, I, I, I cultivated the words. And I trained myself so that the, the venom in the words will come out. The day I said, Jesus, come into my heart, I've never sworn again. When I experienced Jesus after two weeks, when I, when I woke out of my sleep and I saw a man with a gold sash standing over me, I knew it was him. When I walk to work and I feel like a dirty coat coming off my back every day, when I seen the power of God, when I seen what God has done for me, when I seen my wife dying, my children dying, and this God has healed them, how can I now forget what he's done for me? How can I be like those ten, le- the nine lepers? You were cancerous, cancerous, and you, God healed you? We were cancerous in the world. We stunk, we were filthy rags. And this great God of heaven reached down in his mercy and his grace, took us up, washed us in his blood, and now we're too busy to serve him. How can such a thing be? Out of 10, only, one, only 10% came back. One came back and said, thank you. Most of us get up in the morning, we don't even have the time to think about God. Most of us have children, friends, family, parents around, and we don't have the time to input to the next generation. The knowledge we have, we think we don't know much. You'll be amazed when you put into someone else what it can do. You have to have a passion. You've got to develop a passion for God. Look at this in 1 Samuel with me, uh, 22. 400 men come to a cave of Adullam. They're broke. They're discouraged. They're disheartened. They have nothing. They hang around with one, one, little, one young boy or young man by the name of David. David, in, in, in this space of time, has done something. How many of you know living in a cave is not a pleasant place? Have you ever been, ladies, ever been in a house where your husband is depressed or sulking? Men, have you ever been a woman around a woman that's sulking? Or this discouraged or disheartened. You ever been around that kind of people? How I many know when someone walks into the room discouraged and disheartened, it, it brings an atmosphere? Would you agree? When you, you're sitting there happy for your husband to come home and he walks in the house and there's just something around him. And all the joy r- leaves, the children run upstairs and hide. And you like just throw his dinner and you decide you can have a shower or a bath and hide. But imagine now in, in a cave where you're sitting there, you've got your own problems. But then 400 of these losers come in to live with you. Can you imagine? Something in David was greater than what was in all of them put together. And he did something. He took these men and trained them. His men became what we call mighty men. Look at 2 Samuel with me. We're running out of time, so we'll just go quick now. 2 Samuel, chapter 23. Verse 8 says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. The Tecmonite that sat in the seat, chief among captains, the same was Ad- Adino, the Endite. He lifted up his spear against 800 men and he slew at one time. What would that, kind, what would that be, man be in our times today? How much is, what is the, what's his name worth, that American boxer? What's his name? Mayweather. Mayweather. 850 million dollars 
for fighting one man at a time. Could you imagine if I could take on 800 men and pump up that meeting and you fill the auditorium and you go through them one at a time? Could you imagine the money will give you? American Express will sponsor you. Nike will sponsor you. Adidas will sponsor you. Tough as tough, our trainer. They'll give a, a name for your trainers. But how would it impact you if you could take on 800 men? What could, would your pride slay you where 800 men couldn't? These are men that were broke. The, the takes on, how many would fight one man? I saw the video the other day where the terrorist was at one of the tube station and pulled a knife. One terrorist pulled a knife and everyone, <laughs> how many of these 800 men did not come with, with knives. They come with swords. If a man came at you with a sword, would you say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, bring it on? Or would you run for your life? 800 men, and he, whom he slew at one time. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo. That's not a good name for your son, right? <laughs> the Ohonite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines, they were there gathered together to battle. And the men of Israel were gone away. So these three were left by themselves. And it says, and he arose and smote the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword and the Lord wrought a great victory that day and the people returned after him only to spoil. In other words, the people left him and came back for the spoils. Much like church, they come for the blessing. And after him was Shamath, the son of Aji, the Hararite, and the Philistines were gathered together in a, into a troop, which was a piece of ground full of lintels. And the people fled from the Philistines, but he stood. Now, when we read this, remember these men were men who were broken. They were in a cave. What happened? They heard the story of David, how David took on a Goliath. How many of these men are doing greater than the Goliath? David did not take on 800 men. David went after one man, but David's victory empowered them to do greater things. That is why you need to do what God has called you to do and do not be afraid of the challenges in life. Your victory has been watched by somebody else. Others are watching you and say, if they can do it, so can I. And you need to sit people down. Like a lot of preachers tell you the beginning and the end, but they don't tell you the in-between. It's the in-between that people need to hear. The tough times is what they need to know. Not now I drive a, a, a Bentley or Rolls Royce. Not now I got my own private jet. No, the, you need to tell them how you got from A to B. So we understand. Don't be afraid to tell people your testimony. This is what I went through. It looked hard, but God came through for me. Let people know the hardships you face so they get, they, you empower them to now face battles themselves. Are you with me? We stop sugarcoating the gospel and let them think that, oh, I came to church, I served at Usher, and all of a sudden I'm a pastor. No, you go through hell and high water first. Because you can't do this without some testings. You can't do this. You can't teach this without going through some trials. Are you with me? He says, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines and the Lord wrought a great victory. And three of the 30... Chief went down and came to David in the harvest time into the cave, still in the cave of Adelan. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Ref Rephraim. And David was, was in a hold and of the garrison and the Philistines was in, the, it was in Bethlehem. And David longed and says, oh, my Lord, I wish I could get a drink of that water in Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men broke through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem. Can you see the, the passion in these guys? Can you see that the fight in these guys? Guys, listen to me. Let me explain this to you. Tough times is here to stay. I don't care how you wrap it up. There's three kinds of people in this room right now. You're either in a trial, coming out of a trial, or about to go into a trial, but you're in a trial. And you may get a few days where it seems like heaven's arrived, but sooner or later, you're back in a trial. It'd be your health, it'd be your children, it'd be your wife, it'd be something, but there's always something to fight for. 
Because if you don't have something to fight for, you've got no motivation. It is, you hate your job, but your job's keeping you alive. It's the passion of that you go in there, you, you don't like it, but you do it because you don't have a choice. But somewhere you get a better job and you relax, but you can't squat. You've got to keep going. And the challenges in life are what builds strength and faith in you. It's when you've gone through some stuff. I mean, when you've been through some stuff and you've seen the victory, you live differently. And as you, every level you go, there'll be a new devil. The first enemy you'll find on any level of trial is called fear. The first thing you're going to find is fear. I said to Bishop Miller, the first thing you're going to meet is fear. And he laughed. I said, the next thing your confession must be, no fear, it cannot be. And it is well. No fear. It is well. My father-in-law yesterday, I called him before all the negative people come around him to, oh, poor you. Oh, you've been diagnosed with cancer. Oh, what was you? Oh, well, at least you lived for 80 odd years. At least you had a good run in life. No. No, not yet. Granddad, no fear. It is well. When people ask you, how is it? It is. Remember the woman whose son died? Was that well? It is well. No matter what you face, your confession is, my son just died. I got no money. No one loves me. It is what? It is always well. Why is it well? Not because of your circumstances, but because God is on the throne. He's the one who will turn your circumstances around. Can you say amen? Now look at this guy. Let me flip down because I'm going to close now. I've got to go and have my dinner. <laughs> Not really. I've eaten already. Had my salad. He says, and verse 18 says, And Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was, was chief among three. And he lifted up his spear against 300 and slew them. And the, and the name among three. So there's 37 men listed here, all movers and shakers. But you know what? They went into the cave broken, broke, depressed, suppressed, oppressed, depressed. But they encountered someone that was willing to pour into them. You can imagine David sitting around the fireplace and they're saying, what would you be saying to David? Tell me about Goliath. What did you feel? How did you get the courage to do that? And he'd be telling them, you know, my faith in God. Because when I was in the field and the lion came, I knew that God empowered me. I felt something go through my body, something like an anointing. I felt a courage, a faith rise up in me. No fear was in me. I ran out, I grabbed him by a beer and I punched him down. Then the beer had the audacity to come. David, were you not afraid? No, my faith was in God. Did you not get afraid of something? Do you not think a lion could defeat you? No, that lion could not defeat me because God was with me. When the, I ran up to Goliath, he, he told me what he's going to do. I said, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts and I'm going to take your head off today. They heard stories like that. So watch this guy. He says, he says this, this guy says, was he not more on, most honorable of the three? Therefore, he was their captain. How did he attain not unto the first three? And Benaniah, the son of Jehadiah, the son of a valiant man, of Kazil, who had done many acts, he slew two lion like men of Moab. He went down also and slew, slew, a lion, slew a lion in the midst of a pit in the time of snow. Who would slow, slay a lion in a sunny day? If I released a lion in here now, how many of you would sit there and say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you? Huh? If I brought a Rockweiler to church and put him there, most of you would be sitting near the door outside. Can you see what happened to these men? Can you understand if you will take the time to pour into someone else and show them what you've been through and tell them how you went through? And don't be afraid to tell them that the day sometimes was challenging. Sometimes I didn't know how I was going to make it. Sometimes it seemed impossible, but I never fainted in my day of adversity. I never gave up on the God of my salvation. I praised him in the midst of my trials. I rejoiced like Paul and Silas in the prison. I worshipped him when I didn't feel like worshipping. I gave when it seemed like I didn't have nothing to give. I loved when, uh, when I should have hated. I did the opposite to what the devil wanted me to do. And glory to God, here I am today. I'm victorious in Jesus' name. I pray you catch this tonight. I pray you'll rise up. I pray the passion of God will be ignited in your heart. I pray that you'll, oh, the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. I pray that you'll begin to get someone and mentor somebody. Take somebody, mentor some. As you've been mentored, mentor someone else. 
When someone trains you, train somebody else. Find someone, a child, whatever. There's so many young, we've got the, the young guys called, uh, what do we call them again? The, the crown boys. Crown boys are now, some of them are teenagers. Some of you are younger men who are in their 20s. You'd be taking some of these young boys, sit them down and tell them about what God has done for you. Talk to them about the goodness of God. Talk to them about the trials, the testing, the temptation that you've been through. Preempt them of what they're going to go through. Preempt them so when it comes, they'll say, oh, I remember what he said. I know what he said, so now I know what to do. I know how to dodge this one. Help them pour into somebody else. Stop living for yourself. Stop living for yourself. Let me read this. I got this from a book as we close. It's called, um, it's a book by Leonard Revenhill. It, this is a quotation by uh, uh, two men, one called Max Dukes. Max Dukes, an atheist, lived a godless life. He married an ungodly woman. And from this union, there were 310 who died as paupers. 150 were criminals. Seven were murderers. 100 were drunkards. And more than half of the women were prostitutes. Of his 540 descendants, they cost the state over a quarter of a million dollars before inflation. Then there's a record of a great man of God, Jonathan Edwards. He lived in, at the same time as Max Jukes, but he married a godly woman. An investigation made of his 1,394 1394 known descendants, of which 13 became college presidents, 65 college professors, three United States senators, 30 were judges, 100 were lawyers, 60 were physicians, 75 were army and navy officers, 100 were preachers and missionaries, 60 were authors of prominence, one vice president of the United States, 80 public officials in other capacities, 295 college graduates, among whom were governors of state and ministers to foreign countries. Jonathan Edwards' descendant did not cost the state a penny. Quoted in America, is too young to die. Choices. What you choose, you can choose to squat, you can choose to drift, you can choose to be an average Christian, or you can choose to be someone with passion. Pass on your passion to someone else. In church, what a great place to find someone. Go into your home, your wife. What does your wife know about God? What does your children know about God? Is your wife weak? Is your wife strong? What do you teach her? What do you train her? Your training begins at home. My wife is a strong woman. I pushed, I pushed, I pushed, I pushed, I pushed, and I'm still pushing today. My daughters, my son, all strong people. They're not emotional. You know, all that, emo you stop the emotions. How many emotional people make wrong decisions? It's all out of emotion. Some of you are just like, just everything is an, it's just an emotion explosion. It's just like, oh, I, can't do, I can't deal with this no more. I can't do. Shut it. <laughs> Breathe out. What does the word say? What does God say? Do the word. Amen. Stand to your feet with me tonight. He's a good, good father. He's a good, good father. I want you to bow your head to me for a moment tonight. I want to ask you a simple question. Here's a question I want to ask you. Where would you go if you die tonight? you will be amazed how many people presume they'll go to heaven. You say, why would you go to heaven? They say, I'm a good person. Oh, don't move. I'm a good person. I belong to a religion. I do good works. I feed the hungry. I feed the homeless. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't, I don't do anything wrong. Folks, the qualification for heaven is not religion. It's not good works. In fact, Jesus met a religious leader one night. And he said, we know you, the works you do can only be, come from someone who God is with. Jesus did not commend his religious mind. Jesus said to him, except a man be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He says, how can I be born twice? How can I enter my mother's womb the second time? Jesus says, you must be born in the spirit of God. Why? Because in the garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God says, the day you, do, you disobey, you'll surely die. They did not die physically. They died spiritually. A spiritual death is a separation from God. Jesus Christ, the sinless son of God, came through the canals of a virgin woman who was born into this earth, the only sinless man ever born on earth, where his blood was the only blood qualified to pay for sins. His blood was shed on Calvary for our sins. The price has already been paid. All we have to do now is say, yes, 
I accept your sacrifice on Calvary for me. Tonight, I want to pray a simple prayer with you so you can be born again. You can have every sin forgiven. Jesus Christ loves you. No matter where you've been, what you've done, he's not angry at you. He says, he that cometh unto me, I in no wise cast out. He says, take, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I'll, I'm weak, meek, and lowly in heart. I'll give you rest unto your soul. Tonight, you can have peace. You can have joy. You can sleep tonight like you've never slept before. This is a prayer I want to pray with you tonight. It goes like this. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I repent of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior from this day forward in Jesus' name. When we pray that prayer, that at that moment, every single sin in your life is forgiven, washed away by the blood of the Savior. Your name is then written into the Lamb's book of life. The Bible says the angels will rejoice over your salvation. So now I want to pray that with you. With every head bowed, I want to ask you tonight, if you'd like me to pray that prayer with you, we're not going to embarrass you. You're not going to speak into a microphone. We're just going to pray with you right where you stand. Would you raise your hand and put it back down? Show me your hand. Say, bless me, preacher. Raise it wherever you are. We're going to pray tonight. Don't worry about people around you. No one's going to embarrass you. No one's going to judge you. We just want to pray with you tonight. Don't, don't put off for today. Don't put off for tomorrow what can be done today. That's one of the thieves of your destiny. Today's your day. Anyone? Quickly raise your hand. I see your hand. God bless you. Anyone else? Today's your day. I see your hand. God bless you. Anyone else? You put it down. Anyone else? I'm going to count to five. Then we're going to pray. One. Remember this. After today, you don't know if you're going to wake up tomorrow. I'm not trying to frighten you. That's a reality. Someone told me this today. He said, there's someone in church. They were in church on Sunday. Monday morning, they went to wake him up, but he's dead. They couldn't find what it was. He just died that night. You don't know what tomorrow holds. And I promise you this. If you die tonight without Christ, you would beg for five seconds to come back and just pray that prayer. Because this is how serious it is. I want to pray with you. Anyone else, I'm going to pray now. Raise your hand. Put it back down. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. You ready? Just bow your heads with me. Say with me. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I repent of my sins. Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior from this day forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at me. Those of you who raise your hand and pray that for the first time, if you 